the Jew. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, or I wonder what exactly the process was with you all, because you guys obviously understand the power of the images that you're capturing and sharing. Um, as a documentarian, working with that previously existing footage and crafting it in the way that you have in this film, if you could talk to me a bit about how you guys may have worked together on that or how you worked with your editing team on that, we, I'm very curious about it. Sure. Um, so I knew from the very beginning that I wanted the sort of through line of the film to be this exodus from sort of Syria to, to Europe, um, while always coming back and forth to the amazing footage that these guys had captured and continue to capture within Raqqa. Um, but you know, as, as, the, as we continue to film, um, you know, the film became many things for me. It started out as a story of um, the sort of propaganda war, this war of information between ISIS and these guys, but ultimately became you know, a story, an immigrant story, a story of you know, finding themselves in a new land, a story of, of trauma and the cumulative effects of trauma. And so these are all themes that we tried to you know, work in Um, so, Hamoud and Aziz, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the members of RBSS that are still in Raqqa uh, and how you connect with them? Yes, so we still have like uh, 17 members inside and uh, fortunately all of them are good right now, so they are women and men and they are still operating in ISIS territories. It's been hard recently because there are many battles are taking place in the countryside and uh, there were like many process to stop, like to make our work hard. ISIS closed uh, all the internet coffee shops and uh, they've been doing many, like they started to spread many and, or more at point. But uh, they're still okay, they're still good at doing the same. We're going to open up the, to the audience right now, so I'm just going to ask you to uh, raise your hand nice and high, and I will call on you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Um, it's, it's very hard to sit through the film. You live through it, but it's very hard to just stay in the frame, and I thank you, Matthew, for doing it the way that you did. I have a respectful question, and, I'm, and I say that because what I want to know is about God because God is used on both sides here. And I'd like to know from how you, how you talk about God. So, what can, repeat the question, his, his question is about God. He said that God is used on both sides here. So he would like to know how they talk about God. So personally, like for me and for Hamoud, we consider ourselves Muslims, and we're Muslims. And uh, recently, like these extremist groups have started to use that God as a way to recruit people or like to spread their ideology. Uh, we're Muslims, we do believe in God, and that God didn't tell us to do these horrible things. He didn't tell us uh, to do human rights violation, not to kill people. And ISIS, uh, ISIS talking all the, all the time that they are representing the Islam, and 95%, even more, of their victims are Muslims. So they are using that God as a tool, like uh, in a bad way. For us, uh, we're trying to show the truth and uh, to let them know that, like, they are saying that we are unbelievers. So, but we don't need like uh, some people to judge if we are uh, believers or not. So it's something linked to with the God, and. Uh, Personally, we do believe that that does exist, so that's it. Thank you. Yes, Miss. Um, so when you study media war, or this conversation constantly arises, trying to strike a balance or trying to you know, have a conversation between voyeurism into violence and the need for like stark and immediate uh, look at the truth. So how did you find this project finding it, its voice Did everyone hear the question? No. Uh, she's asking how did it find the project's voice, but I think that's probably for all of you. Yeah. Yeah, so first of all, like, none, no one in our group studied any media or any journalism or anything. So 
because we were forced to do that thing. So, uh, but uh, for us it was so important. Since ISIS prevented uh, most, well, not most, all the media organizations to get their own report. And they started to use the media to recruit many people and they started to spread back in news. And right now we're living in a world uh, full of back in news. And uh, for us it was like kind of a duty to do something for our city because we knew no one can, can do it instead of us. So we started this organization and to be in a war with ISIS, so let's say online war, so they had the best equipment, so they had experts. For us, we are a group of uh, young people, our age is between 18 and 28. We came together and we started to do that things, and as I mentioned in the beginning, we didn't study any media or any journals. So, and we were able like, to get this fight with ISIS, and uh, the reason or like, the response of ISIS was to execute and assassinate us, not only in Syria, even outside of Syria. So we knew that our work is so effective. And before we started our organization or our work, googling anything about Raqqa, you will see only us propaganda, us as media. Right now, we will, we will like if you will Google Raqqa, we will show first after Wikipedia, which is a good thing. So it's been like a hard thing to do. It take us like a long time. But we were able like, to reach the international media, the international community, trying to make a change. Unfortunately, we don't have the same equipment, we don't have a fund, and uh, we're still doing this well. Yes, sir. What gives you hope? So, many things. So, <laughs> since, like, there is something many people, they don't know it. ISIS started to be in the news recently everywhere, and everyone is talking about ISIS, but no one is talking about the civilians who are stuck there. So there are more than a million civilians are living there. So they are our families, relatives, friends. So when we see less than 1% of the civilians or local people join ISIS, it means that those people are resistant there. So they can't uh, stand up and say anything against ISIS because they will be killed or executed directly. But not joining ISIS, ISIS, living in these bad conditions, they don't have jobs, they don't have work, and joining ISIS means that, we, that they will get salary in dollars, they will get cars, they will get whatever they want, but even with all that things, they decided to stay home and not join ISIS. So that thing, all that things push us to do this work because uh, the people who are living inside, they have a hope, and they are waiting that the change will come one day. So it gave us a big hope, or a huge hope, to complete this war. And uh, we know that uh, the devil one will not stay for us. Yes, ma'am. What would you like the U.S. to do? So what do you mean with U.S., the government or the The government. The government. Okay. <laughs> Both. <laughs> so, in general, like when I talk about governments, personally, I don't like governments because they're doing bad things. So I don't know. Why. So, all the governments they are looking for their interests everywhere. So, the Obama administration was able to finish all that thing. So, we used to listen promises from Obama that he will help the Syrian people, and it was just a speech. Find any actions, and he used to talk about red lines, and uh, nothing had been changed. So, and if he was able to defeat Assad from the beginning, we'll not end up with Al Qaeda, ISIS, and we don't know who in the future. Right now, with the new administration, uh, like uh, I don't want to talk politics, but like I would make it briefly. So we've seen good thing recently when like that uh, when the US government bombed and recently they bombed an army base to the Syrian regime and they destroyed 20 war planes. If that thing happened like early in the beginning, that would save thousands of thousands of lives. So these war planes <coughs> are throwing foreign bombs, killing civilians daily. So it was a good thing, but it was not enough. So we like uh, 
I do believe that the international community, the U.S. government, they are able to defeat both ISIS, Assad regime, and many other groups. But uh, everyone has interest in Syria, and uh, they wanted this war to complete. But we, I'm so optimistic, so I hope that they will be able to do it. Okay. Happy. So before we go, I, I just wanted to, to also ask kind of about the, the process of gaining the trust, because this is a very, very complicated subject. And obviously with the security issues, I just, I just want to know, you know how you came to the project and how the, you and all of RBSS kind of worked together and you did gain that trust, obviously, to, to make this film. <laughs> um, you should have to answer that one, honestly. That's like I generally defer to Zia. I was traveling around uh, with my last film, Cartel Land, and ISIS was sort of becoming front page news, and I was you know, disturbed like everyone else and trying to see if there's a way into the story. Um, I started down one path that didn't really make a lot of sense, and um, then I read this piece in the New Yorker um, about the guys. Right when I read it, I knew that this was my sort of way into the story. Um, <coughs> I reached out to them through the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, I met them a few days later. They have Aziz and two of them happened to be in DC. And then, you know, they thought about it. And then a week later, they said, you know, let's do this. And so for me, um, you know, the beauty of film, the beauty of documentary film is to show you worlds that you might not otherwise get to see, to introduce you to characters that you might not otherwise get to meet. And so, you know, for me, intimacy, access, trust, that's that's sort of the, the core of what I tr attempt to do, at least. Um, and so, you know, gaining their trust and spending time with them um, was a huge part of this. You know, that last scene in the movie uh, with Aziz, you know, that's a very, very difficult thing to film uh, as a human being, as a, as a filmmaker. Um, but again, that, that, that scene didn't happen two weeks, that was nine months into filming. Um, so that, again, that intimacy is, is key, I think, hopefully to this type of filming. Yes. Yes. Oh, um, I, I, just extraordinary. Um, how, how long did it take to film, and did you, did you feel in, in peril filming it? Did you all hear the question? Yeah. She, she asked, how long did it take to film, and she also asked, Matthew, did he feel in peril while filming? Um, it was pretty quick. I mean, sort of from soup to nuts, I think we finished the film in about a year. Um, filmed for about nine months. Um, edited too quickly. <laughs> um, uh, I don't even want to talk about the danger that I was in because it pales in comparison, in comparison to the danger that they're in. Um, you know, they still live with, with threats from ISIS um, all the time. You know, their members of the group are still in Raqqa, uh, are risking their lives every single second, capturing this information, capturing this footage, capturing these photos. Um, so they're the ones that are that are really in danger. Yes. Uh, the question for uh, these and the guys. Um, I've only been on one side of that intimacy equation when you're shooting something, and I was wondering, you have this American coming in who wants to talk to you and be there in this incredibly intimate moment, like for example, the last scene and a few other moments. What was it like for you guys being on the other side of that, trying to get your story across but also being <coughs> you know, human beings? He, he asked, what was it like uh, establishing intimacy as the subjects of the documentary as opposed to the filmmakers? I didn't get the question very well, but I will try to answer it. So, uh, like we, the thing we used to do what Matt is doing, like to capture videos, to put it online, and uh, we didn't talk about our personal stories. And when Matt first came and uh, told us about his project and to follow us, we found it so important to share our story. And uh, our main goal is to reach out as much as we can from the audience or people around the world to tell them about what's going on in our city. And the movie was like a good way to do it. Being Matt being with us all the, all the time, it was like not a thing for us. So we used to do many interviews, many stuff. 
and uh, we used to have him, so I don't know how we'll spend the next year, so <laughs> <laughs> we're going to miss him. I'll still be here. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Uh, yes. Yes, right here. Yes, you? Hi, this question is for Aziz. Um, I'm wondering uh, how you feel about living between the two worlds of coming to New York City, coming to film festival, and still living, having part of your world be exposed to the crisis in Syria. Yeah, so it's been so easy for us. So because it started to be a normal routine for us. It's like our daily life. So not to be in touch with Syria, we feel that there is something missing. And uh, our bodies are here, but like our soul is still there. So we're thinking all the time, and uh, we have like a good team outside. So since we're here talking with you, they are in touch with our guys inside. So from here, I want to thank both of them. So, and right now we have a new RBSS member. So for security reasons, we don't accept any new members. But everyone who will have a son or a daughter, she or he will be directly a member of us. And I'm glad to welcome baby Muhammad here to the stage. Is it possible? <laughs> Can you bring Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Matthew, I want to thank you so much for sharing this film with us. I want to thank the audience for being here today. I want you all to remember that this film is eligible for the Audience Award, so please download the Tribeca 2017 app and vote today. And please enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you so much. Thank you.